And when we were preparing for this, I was commenting that um, I think it's very good in universities mm. today to see there is a much greater acknowledgement and priority given to uh, translational research. And you said, well, that's not how I would really describe mm -hmm. it. I see myself as an intermediary. I'm curious, mm -hmm. what, what did you mean? Um, I suppose I... I was there at that point trying to avoid any implication that I do something which I think is people are rightly suspicious of now, um, which is the phrasing of giving voice to yeah. marginalised groups or minorities. Um, and I think what Brian said earlier is much more to that point to enable those voices um, to come through. Nevertheless, there are you know literally occasions when you're either you know you're writing a piece or you're in a room with policymakers, and what you're talking about is the empirical evidence that you've acquired. So in my case, that will be um, having gone and interviewed people who are affected by a new by medical technology. Uh, in, in the early days of my career, that was something like IVF or genetic testing, and nowadays it's likely to be something much more esoteric. Um, but it, the, what I do remains the same, which is I go and talk to people and say, or listen to them rather, and say, what are the problems you're facing? Uh, what's, what's good about this? What's bad about this? Um, and the phrase I often use is turning what they say into something that's palatable to and comprehensible to whatever the audience on the other side is, which could be other bioethicists, or it can sometimes be policymakers. And by palatable, I don't mean turning it into something that is comfortable for them to hear, but putting it in terms that make sense to them and that they can make the most use of. <laughs> <laughs>